If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I'd ask you to turn to Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. And we're going to begin reading in verse 10. Acts 26 and beginning in verse 10. The Bible says, Which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them oft in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even in, unto strange cities. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus, with authority and commission from the chief priest, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and then that which sojourned with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me, saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said unto him, I, and I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise, stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles and to, which, and to, whom, I, and to whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sin. And inherit an inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in thee. Whereupon, O Queen Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. <coughs> Dear Lord, we thank you, we praise you, we give you great honor and glory this morning. We thank you already that you have been lifted up, and if we had stopped right now, we could have said it's been good to be in the house of the Lord. God, we thank you for each and every one that's here. Lord, we know they're not here by accident, but rather by divine appointment. In that case, Lord, we pray that you would open their hearts, that you would open them, that you would make them humble unto the reading and the preaching of your word this morning. And we'd be faithful to give you the praise for it, for it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, I'll be preaching this morning, what is God's purpose for you? Uh -huh. Now, every one of us have a purpose. Every one of us have a reason. And what I've found among most people, and especially maybe un under God's people, is minimizing that purpose. Well, I can't do that. I, I'm not smart enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not able. I haven't been ever able to do that. Uh, and, and what I have found, uh, those are simply excuses. And the reason they're excuses, and I'm not saying that I doubt what you're saying, because you know what? In your own flesh, you don't have that ability. You don't, you don't have that, uh, that strength. But in the strength of Christ, you certainly do. And so what it becomes more than an inability is a lack of faith. And all through the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, what was one of the themes of the ministry? Lord, why could we not cast him out? Because you have no faith. No. If ye would have the faith as the grain of a mustard seed you could move mountains. Mm -hmm. So what it is, it's not your ability because it never starts with your ability anyway. It starts with your faith because we have a great God of heaven who has 
endless ability whose ability has never even been tapped. Uh, you know when the Bible says the half has never yet been told. I don't think that was simply talking about Christ's ministry and it wasn't. They could not record what he done in his ministry. The half is his ability that's never been tapped. That, that we haven't used not because it's not there it's because we haven't used it. And, and so we see that as, Paul, uh, as Peter is reviewing his testimony, it's always important to know whom he's talking to, and that's Agrippa. Agrippa was a smart man. He was an intelligent man. He was an educated man. He was the Roman ruler over that province. And his famous saying is this, almost thou hast persuaded me to be a Christian. Mm -hmm. Well, almost don't get it. And, you know, even in that, I think Agrippa had some uh, lack of understanding of God's ability because if God wants to save you, he's going to save you. Yeah. So he really didn't understand even who Christ was. But I want you to see that that but prior to this, what uh, Paul was doing. Have you ever met a man, and I dare say, in rural Tennessee and rural Kentucky, it's almost an impossibility, but have you ever met someone who truly never heard of Jesus? And I'll have to say, I never have. I, I've been trying to witness for a lot and lot and lot of years and I never met someone say, Larry, I don't even know what you're talking about. Have you? I'm clueless. Who was this man named Jesus? Now, in this day, it was a lot, uh, a lot more common for that to happen because they were under Roman occupation and, and the Romans served many gods. They were clueless about the gods uh, the, about the God of the Bible because you you remember when uh, when Paul was walking across Mars Hill he says here you have a, a, here you have a, a, a idol unto the unknown God the God that you don't know and he pointed that out to him you know what I have found uh, in the days which we live people know about Jesus but they don't know Jesus. People know about God, but they don't know God. You see what I'm saying? And, and that, if it is a handicap, and I don't think it is, but if it is a handicap, growing up in the Bible Belt, that is your issue because you've always heard of God, right? You have always heard of Christ. And so Paul, knowing that was not the case of Agrippa, what did he do? He said he simply told them what Christ had done for him. Now, all of y'all know Isaac Kyle. That is Brother Cummings' son-in-law, the one that married Elizabeth. And he was a missionary in the Soviet Union, uh, in Turkey specifically. And, and that is a closed country. He could not go there and say, hey, I'm a missionary for Christ because they would not have let him in. So what he went there is, is an interpreter for English, from Russian to English. And that was his ruse, if you will, to get inside the country. And he said there was, that he had never been in a place where there was no knowledge of Christ whatsoever. Just none. And so what Isaac had found instead of, uh, instead of trying to witness them from the Bible, which he was teaching them English so they understood some about the Bible, was just simply telling them what Christ did for him. That it went a lot further because they were clueless. They, they had no idea. And, and again, in where the culture we live, I can't imagine never hearing Christ. But there are cultures like that. There are, there are individuals that have never been spoken the name of Christ to. So with that understanding, 
Paul did something different. He approached it in a different way. Now back to our text in verse 10, uh, when he says, which thing I also did in Jerusalem. Now what he's talking about there when he says, this is what I did, is the destruction, or I'll say this, the attempted destruction of the Lord's churches. Now, this is the thing with churches. Uh, they're born just like people. They accomplish their purpose. And yes, they do go out of existence. Now, when I was a young preacher, men, well-meaning men, tried to convince me that that's never happened. Well, what I have found is I have seen way too many good churches close. You see what I'm saying? And so it does happen. And, and so if Paul was successful, I don't know that he was, probably some churches he did succeed in closing. We know he didn't close the one at Jerusalem because him and Peter had a relationship after that. They had become yeah, very loose friends. Uh, Paul wasn't always very pop, wasn't always very fond of Peter's approach, but they did know each other. So we know the Jerusalem church never actually really closed down, but Paul was involved in attacking it. Now, his net, uh, so he admits to doing them. Now notice what he says, and, uh, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest, and when they, had, when they were put to death, I gave voice or testimony against them, saying, yes, I saw them worshiping Christ. I saw them meeting on his behalf. I saw them doing these things, and I arrested them for it. And you know what? As pitiful as the court systems were, Except for Christ, they usually require a witness. Remember how on the night before the crucifixion, the lying witnesses couldn't even get their story straight? <laughs> well, they, the reason they tried that is because that's usually what they had to have. So Paul would be called in for a witness and say, yes, this is what I saw. And you know what? That led to their death. Paul was not a good man. Prior to being saved, Paul was not this upstanding Jew, although he always defended himself as a Jew. Verse 11, And I punished them all in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme or deny Christ. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even in strange cities. So he extended this attack on the Lord's church outside Jerusalem. And he began attacking the distant churches, which led him to the Damascus Road experience. You know what? You may think you're running from God, but you know he knows exactly where you're at. He knows exactly when he's going to save you. And he knew of a certainty on that day and on that time that Paul would be on the Damascus Road. Amen. I don't know if y'all remember this, but I preached uh, walking on the Damascus Road one time years ago. Uh, every one of us that's saved has walked somewhere along that type of road. And, and, and so we see that Paul explained himself. This is what I was doing then. then. This is who I was then. And why do you suppose he did that to Agrippa? Because that's who Agrippa was too. He sanctioned the death of the saints. At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. Now, I want you to see that there's always some interruption along the way. You know, have you ever had just the best plan ever? And <laughs> like you young people, you didn't end up at the wedding, did you? You think that's by accident? No, I, I don't know why, but God didn't want you there, right? 
So here you are in Dover. See, that's how our God works. And here come this incredible lie on the road to Damascus and interrupted Paul's plan. You know what we do when we get an interrupted plan? We get mad, <laughs> right? Well, I was going to go to Clarksville today. Now, now I'm going to be messing up the rest of the week. Well, except God's plan above yours. They may not sell it over tomorrow. It'd be better off to go tomorrow instead of today, right? Mm -hmm. But often we don't do that. Now, I also want you to see what is described as the light interrupted him. Now, who is the light? The Lord Jesus Christ, yeah. right? Jesus interrupted his plans. Isn't it a wonderful, glorious thing when Jesus interrupts your plan? Now, we don't always take it that way, but I guarantee you it's for your safety, it's for your benefit, and it's for your good. We just need to accept it for what it is and say, well, glory to God. I didn't want to go to Walmart anyway. And uh, so we see that, uh, that this is the situation that Paul finds himself, and for the very first time in his life, the bright light shined on him. And that, that is when he was saved. And, we were, and when we were all fallen to the earth. Now I want you to see, all of them saw the light, but who was spoken to? Just Paul. Yeah. See, there's, I was dare to say, everyone under the sound of my voice has been in church all their lives. But there's some that hadn't saw the light. I wouldn't agree with the whole lyrics of that song, but you remember the old song, I Saw the Light? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's some reality in that. Now, like I said, I, I don't know about every verse, but there's some reality in the theme of the song. They all saw the light, but one man heard the voice. Have you heard the voice of Christ? I don't mean literally audibly. I probably couldn't hear it if, if, if he spoke to me because my hearing is so bad. But I heard him speak and say, boy, you're a hell-bound sinner. He didn't compliment me, right? He didn't say, you're Jim Lafferty's good son. You know, when you're compared to James, you're always in good shape. <laughs> uh, and... and uh, but he convicted me for who I was. He criticized the sin in my life. And you know what? He didn't save me like that. I struggled about three or four days. I believe the first time I realized my condition was on a Tuesday and he saved me on a Thursday. That was three very miserable days. And, and, and so we see then that the, that the Lord had this great event and he interrupted Paul's progress and then he began to speak to him. I want you to see that it specifically says he spoke, he spoke to them in the Hebrew tongue. Now, uh, me and uh, Brother Justin are fixing to head south and I don't speak much Spanish and I don't believe he does either. So how are we going to get by with an interpreter, right? Now, how, how, many, how many languages could Paul speak? Five, fluently. <coughs> That's why he was such a good apostle. He, he knew all, not only did he know, know Hebrew, he knew all those heathen tongues. And it made him an ideal witness to the Gentiles. That, uh, God can speak whom he will, but I believe that's why he chose him. But here, Christ speaks Hebrew to him. Now, do you know Hebrew? Uh, I don't know a word of it. I don't guess. Jehovah, maybe. I, I know that word. I, I don't know if that's how it's actually said in Hebrew, though. How did he speak to you? He convicted me in a language I could understand. Tennessee English, right? That, 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 that's how he does. And so he, 
he, he began to speak audibly, which is a little different than salvation. Remember, when you study the life and ministry of Peter at the very end of it and at the very beginning of it, always remember he was an apostle. And that sets him apart than the rest of us. It means he heard Christ audibly. It means he, he saw Christ because the other apostles did too. And uh, he was taught best I understand he was taught by directly by Christ and it was actually predicted here he said of the things I will show you and, and so that that made him a different believer but I do want you to see that he was saved very very individually that's what makes this Armenian te Armenian teaching so wrong that you you know uh, there was a boy there uh, preaching and he said uh, he said he had a member in his church years ago and uh, and the boy was in the military and the Lord saved him and he had a large family and they all loved the Lord and he got transferred to a base in California and he ran into this gentleman on the streets of Los Angeles said now when you meet somebody you should have them saved in 10 minutes you know what that is that's the Romans road You, it doesn't matter if you accept it or not. You know what? You're a sinner. Right? That's our nature. That's who we are. And so we see the, the error in that. And this little boy immediately called his old pastor and said, what's this guy talking about? See, that, that wasn't this kind of experience, was it? He met Christ on the road to Damascus. And that, that is what we need as God's people, as preachers and teachers of the Word of God. This is what we need to teach. So he heard it in his own language. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Now, you're going to see a little bit of differences uh, between the event that's recorded in in Acts 9 and the event and the and the testimony if you will that is given here in Acts 27 does it mean it's inconsistent no do you tell the same story the same way all the time I don't y'all heard my testimony of salvation uh, sometimes I, I, I mentioned the the free will church at Carlisle sometimes I mentioned brother Wayne and other times I just say the Lord saved me he saved me in a strange place. You see what I'm saying? So this is not inconsistency with the Word of God. It's just him remembering and telling them about his salvation. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Again, a very individual and effectual call to one man at that time. Huge group with him. God spoke to Saul. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now, I won't say I totally understand this, but this is verbatim from Acts chapter 9. So it's very, very significant. If the Bible says it one time, it's significant. If it says it several times, you better stick up and listen. Now, again, I can't say... I believe it was the Holy Ghost nudging him along and reminding him of the death of Stephen and, and Stephen saying, Behold, I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of the Father. But I don't know that. It just says it's hard to kick against the pricks. And it does show me this. Paul was resisting because why would he have said it is hard for thee to go or, or move against the pricks if he wasn't doing it. And, and so uh, you that are smarter than me and more studied than me, you can, uh, you can straighten me out on this, but I know that it's significant to, uh, <laughs> to kick against the pricks because it's mentioned verbatim twice. Verse 15, And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Now, who initiated this? 
Did Paul initiate it? No, he was mad and about to go down and break up the church at Damascus. So he wasn't seeking God. He wasn't asking Jesus into his heart. Total opposite. He was mad and he saw one more church on his bed and he was going to take it down. Then God interrupted, didn't he? See, that's what we believe different than most, is it not? And you know what? When God interrupts your life, you'll never be the same again. And if you are, you better make your call and you let you sure. Because you may not have what you think you do have. And, and so we see that Christ intervenes and he knows he's Lord. And he says, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. You ever per persecuted Christ? Now all of us want to say in unison, no. Right? Again, we're back to the Bible Belt. Now, I'll say this. 50 years ago when I was a boy, I saw, I saw people respect the name of Christ. But in reality... You know, your only option if you're not saved is to persecute Christ. Why? How? Got some good, good children in here the Lord has not chose to save yet. You say, well, what are they doing? They're just children. They're good boys. They're good girls. Denying who he is is persecuting him. Right? You believe he's God? Do you believe he's the Son of God? The very incarnate that always has been and always will be, that's a revealed truth, right? That, that, that comes from the Almighty and the Almighty alone. You don't get that by yourself. And, and so we see uh, um, that, yes, we do, in fact, persecute Christ unknowingly probably all the time. God's plan for his life. Now, this is the purpose. This is what the, the emphasis of the message is about when God has a different plan. What was your plan for your life? What, what did you think you would do? What, what, uh, now, I really didn't realize I wanted to be a nurse until I was 18. And then I knew that's what God wanted. Well, I'll put it this way. Scratch that. That's what I wanted. And so I began to pursue that in different ways. And you know what? The Lord was good. <laughs> I'm living the dream, right? You know what I did not want to do? I never even considered being a preacher. But God interrupted me. Now, my in-laws may throw books at me now, but me and Donna talked about very seriously about moving to Nashville. And I wanted to work at Vanderbilt because if you work at Vanderbilt, you get a discount at their school. And I wanted to be a nurse practitioner. And back then, I had the smarts for it. I bumped into a girl the other day. She has her doctoral degree in nursing and teaches at Austin P. And she and I were talking. We bumped into that little festival thing they were having down at the park the other day. And she said, Larry, why did you never finish your degree? And I stood there a minute and I said, well, I said, Michelle, I don't think I had the smarts for it. And she looked at me real serious and she said, Larry, you may hire on the GRE than I did. And I think about that a minute. I and mean, I wanted to say, well, I had five children to feed. But what I really, uh, what I, what, you know why I didn't do that? Because it wasn't in God's plan. Now, would I have liked it? Yeah, I would have enjoyed it. Uh, that would have been a cool thing to do. You make a lot more money there than you do as a nurse. But it wasn't God's plan. It, it wasn't what he wanted. He wanted me to be a Tennessee Hills country preacher. And you know what? I wouldn't do anything else now because that's God's will for my life. He is a will changer. He's a plan changer. So what is his plan for you? That, that is the critical question that you must ask. 
but rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. Underline that word. Star it. He did these actions on behalf of accomplishing a purpose with that boy's life. To make thee a minister and a witness. See, two different, already two different plans. I'm going to make you a minister or a preacher, and I'm going to, and I'm going to make you a witness. Well, you say, that's the same thing. No, no. Remember, I just told you sometimes all you can be is a witness because they have no idea what you're talking about. A witness. And he says, I'm going to make you that. Both of these things which thou hast seen and of the things in which I will appear unto thee. So again, I have that underlined in my Bible. Uh, after this experience on the Damascus Road, Paul learned a lot of other things, and you can gain them by reading the church letters because he conveyed them to us in that. Delivering thee from people and from the Gentiles unto whom I now send thee. Then we have a third thing. He's going, he, he is going to witness, he's going to minister, and then he gives them a specific group to go to. You go to the Gentiles. Don't you waste your time with the, with the Jews. Who was the minister to the Jews? They did have a minister. Peter, right? Now, they didn't listen to him very well, but they did have a missionary. They did have a voice, and they can never in the day of judgment say, we didn't know, because they did. Verse 18, God's plan for those people to open their eyes. I really don't know how many people has been saved down through the years, and it's really, I'm not a scorekeeper, it's really, it's neither here nor there, really. But I know of, of two. One of them was when I was at South Road. That's the one meeting kids, and Donna barely got out of the life. But there was this young woman there, and I won't say who she was. She was a preacher's daughter. And I preached a message about salvation, and she ran up to the front. And I thought she was saved. She always professed salvation. And I said, so and so, what's wrong? She said, Brother Larry, I'm lost. So I witnessed to her of the goodness of God, the Lord saved her, and it made her daddy mad. <laughs> See, uh, it's my job simply to witness. And, and, and it wasn't my preaching. There's a little boy, and he's at uh, Faith and Clarksville now. And I wasn't, you know, God's going to use what he's going to use. And I don't even remember, I don't think I was preaching on the terms of salvation in that message. But a little boy called me later. He hugged me and thanked me. He said, I couldn't get no sleep after you preached. And the Lord saved me. Now that's two that, uh, that has actually come back and said, thank you, thank you. But you know what? That's not the point. The point is, just be faithful. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't Paul's uh, ministry to keep up with numbers. It was Paul's ministry to preach to the Gentiles. And he was very, very faithful to that ministry. And so we see that he gives him a three-part ministry. He gives, he gives Paul a group to approach. And then he says, And they shall receive forgiveness of sin and an inheritance among them that are sanctified by faith, which is in me. So faith in Christ. You ever read the fullness of the cross work, the work on the cross, the work of redemption. It was a very horrific, bloody, bloody death. It was, um, 
unbelievable. And everybody thinks it's insignificant. But two things, and I think it's the Gospel of John, maybe the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Matthew, one way or the other. He says, it is finished. Now, two things with that. First of all, every drop of his life's blood had to be shed. And I, I literally mean bleeding. Dear brother, Jody told us about this woman that needs prayer. And he told me what her hemoglobin was. And I literally have never heard a hemoglobin that low in 30 years of nursing. I don't see how she was standing up. Jesus was lower. Every drop of it. And, and then on top of that, you know why he said it's finished? His work was done. He had, he had been the sacrifice. Now it was fixing to be the, the, the resurrected Savior. See, whatever he's given you to do, do it to the end. Don't quit halfway. Do it to the end. And you know what? That's so simple to say, but it's so difficult to do. I've known a lot of preachers that stowed in the towel in the 30 years that I've been preaching the gospel. And you know what? I'm not, I'm not criticizing them because I may be the one tomorrow. But I do know this. Christ didn't quit. And I do know this. Paul didn't quit. See, we need to figure out what he has us to do. And we need to do it to the day we die. That's a rough, rough truth, is it not? But you know what the biggest, the most difficult thing about that truth? You have to give up what you want to do. What do you want to do? Serve God or serve the world? Now, is there anything wrong? Would I have been an, an extra bad sinner if I had become a nurse practitioner? No, in fact, I might have actually helped some people physically. But you know what? It would have been detrimental to my spiritual condition. Not because it's a bad thing to be a nurse practitioner. It was the fact that it wasn't the will of God for me. You see what I'm saying? So what's your ministry? What are you to do with the rest of your life? And this morning, can you get in that spot and stay there? That's what we need. That in, in the year which we live today, if anything we ever need, we need men and women to find their spot, to get in it, and stay there till they die. Remember, second time he wrote to the Thessalonians, or think, or maybe it was second time to Timothy. And get no. He said, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Was he boo-hooing about it? <coughs> no, I believe he was excited. <laughs> I, I, I believe that he, that he said, man, it, this is fixing to happen. I'm going to go home to be with Jesus. In other words, he kept that ministry going to the very end. What about you? Where's your pocket? Where's your spot? I've had more nursing jobs than Carter's got peanuts. You know what? That doesn't matter because that's not my ministry. I've been here almost 25 years. That's my ministry. Get in it and stay there. Very simple thing, is it not?